All right, so apologies for the wait in the beginning of this. I uh, am still figuring out the Twitter spaces bullshit, and uh, the general vibe of my Twitter spaces will be that um, it, you know, I don't like the other spaces. I think they're unproductive. I think there's a lot of interruptions, a lot of talking over each other, a lot of bad faith bullshit. And so when I like, started to use the feature myself, that being basically last week. Uh, I had a very productive conversation with ANCAP Air on here, and um, it ended with ANCAP Air saying uh, that he would be interested in a Christian Anarchy stream today. Uh, Things didn't quite work out that way, but um, the general thing here will be uh, productive conversations for the purpose of actually getting to the heart of matters and learning some shit. So, with all that being said, um, I, I think there was dead air in the beginning of this, so I'll, I'll include at some point a timestamp um, of where the actual stream starts. But for now, um, let's get this going. The uh, person I have on today, uh, and you can tag whoever you want if you uh, have some other people that you want to participate or just directly invite them yourself through the app, uh, is only King Christ on Twitter, and I'm assuming that's a reference to uh, no king but Christ. Uh, yes, sir. You got it. That's it. Yeah. So, the first thing I think that would be interesting for the subject of Christian anarchy um, is like when people hear the term Christian anarchy, especially atheists, you know, uh, like other believers of other faiths. Um, they often recoil because of the idea of following a king. Um, And when I bring up to them that a voluntary relationship is far different to an involuntary one, um, they don't really have a whole lot of answers for that. But I would be interested on your particular, like, take on No King But Christ. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um... The, the real important thing there is when Christian anarchists say we're anarchists, we're more referring to governments that are man-made and on the earth. So that was kind of one thing that you uh, pointed out there. Uh, we actually often will joke that we're just uh, monarchists because we do follow a king, Jesus. Um, so uh, it, it, it does cause some confusion sometimes. It also depends on the audience. Um, to, for some people, I'll describe myself as a Christian anarchist. Uh, Other times I'll describe myself as a Christian voluntarist. Um, I've even mentioned being an agorist at some point to some people. So it also kind of helps to morph what terms you're using based on the audience. I do like using Christian anarchist because it makes people have to respond. It triggers something in them like, wait a second, you mean like, you know, blow everything up? Well, Well, no, that's not what it actually means. So it gives me a good spot to be able to uh, mention what anarchy actually means and how the words uh, work and meaning without archy, meaning with ruler. Um, But what you pointed out, one important thing there, which was the consensual relationship with Jesus. Uh, Jesus doesn't come steal money from my wallet. He doesn't make me pay taxes. He doesn't hold uh, a gun to my head. He doesn't force me to do that like actual earthly government does earthly government holds you hostage, doesn't let you escape. Um, The joke, you know, when talking with people about anarchy is we'll just move elsewhere. Well, where would I move that there's not going to be a government there trying to hold me hostage? Mm -hmm. They can't, they've they've never mentioned one because there isn't one. So the, the, the actual idea of Christian anarchy and when I use it and I'm talking with others and I'm trying to uh, get them to buy into what that is, is basically I ignore government as much as possible because I am solely focused on only following Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things that's interesting to note is um, that uh, and, and, and I think that this is something that more people should realize when the slaves wanted freedom from their masters in America um, one of the things that they practiced was like liberation theology. They they would read the Bible and be like, you know what? Um, you wanted me to learn this because it's Eurocentric, but it's not actually Eurocentric, and it doesn't come from the position 
of accepting earthly masters. In fact, here's all these things about, like, the unethicality of many modern mechanisms, including not serving two masters, including not serving wealth, and all these other things. And um, if, if I serve God, therefore I can't serve you. Um, and at the very least, I'll have access to, like, heaven. Um, and so, like, there's a, there's a whole lot of people who would use, like, liberation theology to motivate their fellow, like, slaves to become freemen. Um, and, like, when people don't know that and they assume that Christianity is just, like, exclusively a control system, um, like, I think that comes from a rather, like, like Western, modern-centric sort of uh, biased view of it. Like, there are some you know, maybe, like, verses that could be used for various things, but, like, ultimately, the the message of Christ specifically is very much a freeing one. Um, do you have any, like, verses you go to when you're trying to resist authority? Yeah, um, there's several to go to. I think one of my favorite examples is, uh, for, well, first, let me back up for a second. Not a problem. First, it's, first, it's important to understand that Jesus asks his followers to pick their battles. And some of those battles we are supposed to lose. Uh, Jesus would tell his uh, followers, if someone wants to sue you and take your cloak, give him your tunic also. He doesn't say fight for your cloak. He says, just be willing to give up more. Um, that's kind of what Romans 13 talks about. Romans 13 gets into a spot at the end there where it says, uh, pay your taxes for the government workers need to be need to be paid also. Well, you're not really pay. You're not agreeing to pay the government workers in that case for the services they provide. Government doesn't provide good services. They rip people off. They don't even allow me a chance to not pay for services I don't use. But what that's really focused on there is those workers have families and those families have needs and those families have children and those families need food and clothing and shelter. So allow yourself to be stolen from such that you can support the needs of people. Don't fight against that. You're, you're feeding children is a, is a good way to think about it. Um, so there are times when you're supposed to allow yourself to be harmed. And, and that's part of what Jesus showed us was just allow yourself to be harmed. Focus on something greater. But my favorite example is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the Old Testament. And the reason for that is it was very easy to just say, oh, it's a fake golden statue. We all know it's fake. You know, it's meaningless. It's not a real God. We should just blend in and not cause an uproar, uh, and, and, and nobody will know. It'll be no big deal. But they didn't. They picked their battles, and they knew one battle that was always important to pick was the battle where you stand up for who God is, his authority, and we stand up for who Jesus is and his authority. And the apostles kind of duplicate that uh, in Acts, where they are willing to go for prison for preaching Jesus, and they're beaten and told, quit preaching. And as soon as they get out, they go back to preaching. Um, there are things that we should definitely make sure as Christians that we're working to win. And that's telling people about Jesus, telling the people about the gospel, um, and helping convert people to being followers of Jesus. Now, the reason we allow ourselves to be harmed, the reason we allow ourselves to be stolen from or uh, as Americans today, we're kind of just people in a tax farm, is we don't want to do something in a violent manner or a manner that's causing uproar over something not focused on Jesus because we don't want to detract from telling people about Jesus. Um, you know, if you try to tell someone about Jesus and they say, oh, well, you're the guy that was holding guns to the tax man's head at the front door. Mm, I don't know. Versus what does that look like when they say, oh, you're the guy that, you know, lost everything because he was trying to follow what Jesus said. I want to be like that. So we don't want any of our actions to become detractors to the message of Jesus. And that's why I always kind of frame it how I framed it earlier, working to try to just 
ignore and avoid government as much as possible. Just try not to have interactions. Um, in first uh, Timothy two, for example, um, in verse two, we're commanded pray this way for kings and all who are in authority so that we can live quiet and peaceful lives lived and mar marked by godliness and dignity. So that's our goal. Our goal is just to try to live peacefully, to try to live quietly and to try to not have the kings and authorities all up in our business and just try to create that separation. Yeah. And well, so the, a few responses. The first response is that especially in nations like America, uh, the people in charge will often try to co-opt Christian imagery for an obviously anti-Christian government. Um, in God we trust, swearing in on the Bible, praying publicly, publicly affiliating with various religions and churches and ethno-states. And there is something to be said for, like, in my view anyway, um, for like, throwing the money changers out of the proverbial temple. Um, the general, like, vibe of Christianity obviously has to be peace, but sometimes there, it, there are circumstances in which you must sell your cloak and buy a sword, I'm assuming you would say. Uh, actually, I, I'm not. I, I, I'm more on the pacifist level teaching gotcha. of the scriptures. Uh, when, when Jesus, for example, just to reference there in Luke, what you're talking about, when Jesus says in verse 36, sell uh, your cloaks and buy a sword, verse 37 says that he did this so that the prophecies would be fulfilled, that he was numbered with the transgressors. Um, and then, and then shortly after that verse, I think it's 38, verse 38 says, and they said, we have two swords. And Jesus said, it is enough. Well, if you have 13 people and you know part of a Roman detachment is coming, does, does two swords sound like enough? <laughs> only, two, two only, swords. <laughs> only with God on your side, but I guess. Yeah, yeah. But, but, you know, effectively, two swords was never going to do anything. So it was literally there. Uh, if you recall, Peter uses one of the two to, to cut off the ear and that's kind of where that whole fulfilling of the prophecy of that he was numbered with the transgressors comes from. Jesus never actually says, arm yourself to the teeth. Let's let's duke this out. Um, so on that front, you know, I, I would disagree with that point. I would say that Christians need to be the most vocal people on the face of the planet. However, um, Christians should be loud. Christians should be part of protests. Um, utilizing social media however they can. Um, I usually often am found wearing a t-shirt that has some type of uh, anarchist Christian message across it. The one I'm wearing right now says Peacemaker um, from a, a group that I uh, donate to. Um, we should be absolutely loud. But as soon as we go to take major actions against those authorities, we would lose a lot of credibility and simply for the fact when Jesus is before Pilate, does, does Jesus say you're not the authority? I have the authority. Uh, does Jesus whip out a sword? Does Jesus strike him with lightning? Like he was, he would have been capable of doing. He doesn't do any of that. He just sits there peacefully. Um, and so I think Christians would do harm to the message if they were to try to uh, take some form of violence or some type of physical action. But to your point, we should be the loudest voice against those misuses of scripture, against those misuses of authority, and against those misuses of power. And to go back to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, uh, was their voice pretty loud? It was huge. I mean, it's to the point that their speech it says the king, uh, I think it was Nebuchadnezzar, as I recall, um, was distorted with rage and anger. Um, and, and that's what Acts 17, when, when we can take that over to Christians, because I'm trying to make this a, a picture for you. Yeah. I'm um, in Acts, Acts 17. Um, they're there. And it says that. In verse 6 and 7, not finding them there, they dragged them out and some of the believers 
took them before the city council. Paul and Silas have caused trouble all over the world, they shouted, and now they are here disturbing our city too. And Jason has welcomed them into his home. They are all guilty of treason against Caesar, for they profess allegiance to another king named Jesus. The people of the city, as well as the city council, were thrown into turmoil by these reports. What can our speech as Christians do? We can literally disturb and turn cities upside down. That's how we affect pointing to Jesus by acting like Jesus, by speaking like Jesus, and by enduring wrongs against us like Jesus. Yeah, you know, that's why a lot of the people uh, in charge, um, you know, on any given side of politics, uh, want to control speech. They understand its power. Um, I mean, from a Christian standpoint, especially if you're a Christian that follows the Old Testament as well, um, the Christian standpoint includes uh, the, like, uh, understanding of Jericho, the raising of your voices, being able to crumble empires. And uh, to me, that's a very powerful message. The message is that uh, those with a superior philosophy can potentially do the most damage to those with weak foundations. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I get into discussions often with Christians uh, on the topic of voting, for example. And one thing to, to point to your uh, example of Jericho there is, is our voices and faith in God will can do more than our vote ever could hope to do. And so I'm always encouraging Christians, you should be speaking out and praying and focusing more on that and less on getting people to vote and less on who to vote. Because in the end, guess what? Who has all the power anyhow? Who has all the authority? Well, God does. So why would we focus on our little meager attempt at voting that, at least in the United States, probably isn't even counted, and skip over pleading to the one who has the power to just make all the changes? Um, and, and that's kind of what I was talking about at the beginning is getting Christians to focus on the things that we can do and the things that matter and the things that affect change and not being distracted. Um, usually in talking with other Christians, I tell them voting is a distraction. The political cycle is a distraction. Those things are trying to get you to focus on somebody that's trying to take authority that's not Jesus. Stop wasting your time and focus on Jesus. For sure. And, you know, I can't shake the the idea. Like, I remember there was this uh, this series of verses between the widow and the rich man and the fact that he kept on pouring his coffers in very publicly as a public display of um, alleged devotion, but it really wasn't that. And Jesus was very clear that he has his reward, meaning that uh, there will be no reward for that person in heaven. It's basically like, you, uh, you, you need to do better in like, uh, in like being humble because if if you're getting your reward from other people's like adoration and them like basically worshiping you over me, then they're following you and not me. And in doing so, uh, like to me, what that sort of also says is that like all these people because 90 like it's, it's something like 87 percent of um of congress people who win elections allegedly in massive air quotes who win elections they win those elections because they got the most money and so when the bible says you cannot serve both god uh, god and mammon you cannot love both god and uh, god and money basically um what that means to me is that it's also saying you can't serve those who serve mammon. And if the people who win are the people who get the most money to their campaigns, in order to support the political process as a means of change, you sort of have to worship mammon to an extent. You have to, you know, give, give us your money, give us your money. Uh, you have to go to the rich donors who can provide the most money to your campaign, like, for instance, Mike Bloomberg and Biden. Um, and in doing so, you have to sell out fundamental principles of following Christ's likeness. Uh, and to me, the entire political process 
uh, from step to stern, compromises the actual notions of Christ following. Oh, no, absolutely. Completely agree with all of that. Um, you know, the whole system is just chasing power and money. And why a Christian would want to interject themselves chasing power and money is just, I don't understand. I mean, even the apostles were trying to chase power for, for a little bit with Jesus. And, you know, two of them decide to ask when he's the king, can they sit at his right hand? Mm-hmm. And, he, and he, he rebukes them. He says, that's, that's not it. You're missing it. He says, you know, the Gentiles lord it over but it will not be that way among you. Christians are supposed to be servants following in the manner that Jesus acted and lived. He was the true servant. And so we're supposed to be following in that manner. I mean, I I would even argue that anyone really trying to take office can't be a Christian. Um, I don't know if you saw that picture I posted on my Twitter earlier today, but that question that that Tucker Carlson asked Putin, you know, you, you you rule by killing and, and leaders rule by killing and Jesus was against killing. How can you rectify this? And it was probably one of the best questions that have ever been asked in any interview ever. Um, and, and Putin gave some poor understanding and as his answer, he gave an answer of poor understanding of scripture, um, you know, more about protecting the motherland and self-defense and everything. But But that's not what Christians are called to. Christians are called to give up. That's why Jesus says, do not fear the one who can kill the body, you know? So that's part of the whole political cycle. It's predicated on fear. And they go around telling you, well, if you don't vote for this person or vote for that person, well, you should have some fear because they're going to kill you or they're going to take your stuff or whatever. And Jesus has been telling us this entire time, well, don't fear. And Christians fall to that yet again and again and again and they fall into fear and more fear and more fear yeah well and and that's one of the things like christians oftentimes like they will fall down the same path that generated the westboro baptist church it's about fear and hate and distance and not sitting with anyone who might even a hair disagree with you and never communing with people, not aligning with people, not, you know, accepting people where they are in order to get them where you want them to be. They're shit salesmen. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that happens, but I I think also we just, we should be a little careful there. You know, Joe Biden and, and Chuck Schumer and all those people will get up front and tell you they're Christians. I think we should be careful. You know, Scripture tells us that true Christians are those who love others. True Christians are those that seek peace. True Christians are those that display the fruits of the Spirit. I, I don't think we should go in in, in that manner, at truly believing that people that just label themselves as Christians but don't act it are indeed Christians. So those people, yeah, th- they're poor salesmen of Christianity, But that's really because they're acting against Christianity. They're just utilizing a label for their own gain. Absolutely. And they're they're doing it because also if you invoke the power of the name of Christ, then people who have similarly, like, you know, gained something from somebody else talking about it, there's that response in their brain that they'll say, well, this person is associated with the same thing that I've seen positivity from before. So this person is also positive. But that's not always the case. It's literally the wolf in sheep's clothing kind of mentality. Yeah, and, and governments pick up on that. And honestly, I would say it's because governments are kind of uh, run by Satan. Um, but even in the Philippines, for example, in the Philippines public schools, they teach Christianity now in public schools. And it, they do that because they found that people that are Christians are easier to control. And, and it just—it shouldn't be that way. Yeah, yeah. Uh, mind expanding on that? I actually—I hadn't heard of that. Uh, I mean, I did. I wasn't prepared to go in on expanding on it. I just—I uh, use that in talking in conversations with people, gotcha. and uh, as an example of, look, um, just because you're a Christian, don't fall for being manipulated by governments, because governments are going to try to appear as angels of light. 
and they're not. And so we're supposed to be, as Christians, discerning who is actually of Jesus and who is just merely lying and, and not of Jesus. For sure. Like, and, and you know, a, an example of that uh, that you'll probably find amusing, um, one of the churches I used to go to, uh, one of those churches, uh, it was like, it eventually handed out what they called voting guides. And what this church did was it handed out pamphlets with a policy, and I'm not making this up, you're maybe going to laugh, but <laughs> it's like it handed out pamphlets, little pieces of paper with a policy, and then next to that policy, one or two thumbs up, and then a thumb down. And it was like <laughs> designed to tell you, without explaining why, not to or to vote for certain policies or people or etc., and it said, your faith-based guide to voting. Well, I guess it is faith-based. It's faith in the people <laughs> who wrote that, that they weren't, like, full of shit. And that they weren't, like, damaging the message or walking away from Christ in order to get there. Because there was no verse cited. There was no, like, policy cited even. All there was was a little thumb emoji. And I guess that works if what you're trying to do is propagandize, but if you ask me, there are plenty of churches who would rather you have faith in humans than God. Yeah, for sure. For and, sure. And I think one of the problems is that a lot of these churches are heavily affiliated with the establishment. Like, the establishment wants to co-opt religion, and they always have. Um, and, like, the Joel Osteens of the world, the Ken Hams, the Kenneth Copelands, the people who, you know, just want to wring Christianity out for every last dollar it can give them because it's not about the blood of the lamb, it's about the green in the bank. Yeah, that definitely happens for sure. Um, I think that's why, you know, Jesus in Scripture calls Christians to, to humility and, and peacefulness and everything is because it even if you're a very strong christian and you enter into the world of politics or money chasing or anything and you tell yourself oh well you know i'm strong enough i can uh, survive all the the evils that happen within those spaces well it, it usually never happens usually everyone falls and succumbs to chasing that power that comes with you know authority via a government position or money or whatever it falls into yeah, and, like, that's the other half, is that this is government money. Is that this this government money that they have in these churches, the, this government money that runs the system, that you need to ask the government for permission to use, this government money is mammon. It is, it is the, the, like, lifeblood of Moloch. It is the, like, tempter. Like, when, when that rich man came to Jesus and asked, you know, like, I've done all of these things that, that you have said, what else shall I do? And Jesus knew the contents of his heart and said, you know, uh, you got to get rid of everything you own and follow me. You got to sell everything you own and follow me. And he was distraught and left Jesus because he's like, well, I don't want to do that. But Jesus said, it's like, you know, it's, it's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And this is because, like, the wealth uh, is leashing one to the system in which it was generated and making people follow a different master than God. Yeah, I mean, and, and on that, another example, uh, when Paul is before King Agrippa, he tells them, you almost have persuaded me to be a Christian. Well, what do you think his hangup was? <laughs> Almost. <laughs> Darn it, so I mean, close. I, I mean, the, the guy's literally sitting in a seat of authority and power, and Paul's teaching him about Jesus, and that's going to require him to do what? Give up authority and power. Yep. Uh, you know, so instantly he, he gets almost there, but only almost, you know, because the power is just, I mean, people – there's people out there that laugh at the imagery in the Lord of the Rings, for example. But is that not exactly true in how it works? Yeah, it is. I mean, everyone's out there just seeking the power. I want the power. If only I had the power. If you gave me the power. Um, you know, people, <laughs> there are even people I hear, well, my favorite argument that they say was, well, if I was the president, everything would be fixed. 
No, if you were the president, stuff would stay the same because you would have succumbed to money and power chasing. In order um, to get there to begin with. Yeah. And I mean, that's, you know, one of Tolkien's quotes uh, that I like to use uh, in his uh, one of his letters to his son is that, you know, the most improper job is bossing men around. Not one in a million are fit for it, least of all the one who seeks the opportunity. Um, you know, and yet we'll hear Christians seeking, you're trying to seek the opportunity, which is my one of my favorite. That brings me to one of my favorite passages about that and discussing with people is over in um, Matthew 4, where Jesus is tempted. And one of the temptations is Satan says, here's all the kingdoms. I'll give them to you. Does Jesus say, no, Satan, they're not your kingdoms. They're mine. Does Jesus say, okay, well, yeah, I'll take the kingdoms because I can fix everything. Does Jesus say, oh, well, if I have all the kingdoms, you know, I'll, I'll solve all the problems in the world and, and take care of everything. No, he doesn't. There's no reason for him to seek that power, to take that power, because he knows that that power is going to cause problems and would cause his disobedience. So he merely tells Satan, you shall worship God and serve him only. And that is a, a, a quote of Jesus that Christians should be using more and more today. You know, when they find themselves in the voting booth, think that they're fi- thinking they're finally going to, you know, el- elect this new authority that's going to hold their neighbor's feet to the fire. They should really be thinking about what Jesus says there. We shall worship God and serve him only. Like focus on God, focus on that. And don't be distracted by what this authority or this fear or anything that, that comes upon you might do. Yeah, like in the, in the quote you're talking about, it was a letter to his son, 1943. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. so around the like World War II era, um, my political opinion, opinions lean more and more toward anarchy, philosophically understood, meaning the abolition of control, not whiskered men with bombs, <laughs> or to yep. unconstitutional monarchy. I would arrest anybody who uses the word state in any sense other than the inanimate real of England and its inhabitants, a thing that has neither power, rights, nor mind, and after a chance of recantation, execute them if they remained obstinate. If we could go back to personal names, it would do a lot of good. Uh, I think he was joking about that. <laughs> Government is an abstract noun, meaning the art and process of governing, and it should be an offense to write it with a capital G or so uh, to so refer to people. The most improper job of many, even saints, who at any rate were at least unwilling to take it on, is bossing other men. Not one in a million is fit for it, and least of all those who seek the opportunity. There is only one bright spot, and that is the growing habit of disgruntled men of dynamiting factories. Uh, and power stations. I hope that encouraged now as patriotism may remain a habit, but it won't do any good if it's not universal. That's such a good quote. Yeah. Like, um, the the general thing that I think, like, and it's not just Tolkien. Like, it's, like, another Tol, Tolstoy. Like, people... Mm-hmm. People who th- know Tol- Tolstoy simply for war and peace because that was forced on them in schools are missing out a lot. Like his works, only the, the kingdom of God is within you. Like those works are impactful. They like they really drive at the root of a lot of these problems in that the, the root of a lot of these problems are a people who would rather follow um mam and the god they they they're trying to walk in darkness and light would you agree with that yeah and you know uh tolstoy did come up with most of those words um you know that's in the gospel of luke mm-hmm. in uh chapter 17 verse 21 neither shall they say low here or low there for behold the kingdom of god is within you i mean that's a that's a teaching of jesus absolutely um, And so what we need to ask ourselves as Christians or what, you know, and I've asked myself, and that's why I'm at this point in my uh, journey of faith is and what other Christians should be asking themselves, though, is, is what kingdom am I bowing to? You only get one citizenship. You get to bow to one king. You can only serve one master. And that's why I love that example I gave of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, just because of what they say. 
I mean, their faith, when I was talking about earlier about Christian spearing, I mean, uh, they even tell him, he says, look, I'm going to, I have the power. I'm going to kill you. And they said, look, God will save us. But even if he doesn't, we're not doing it. Mm-hmm. And too many, too many times Christians go, oh, well, okay, well, since you threatened me, let me just, just bow down and, and, and worship it. Let me just do it. Let me just follow. And um, in doing that, they're giving up what belongs to God. God wants 100% of our obedience. He wants 100% of us proclaiming him as king. He doesn't want to be 85% king and us, you know, and nominate 15% king for somebody else. He wants it all. And so I've always figured if he's powerful enough to create everything, then if he wants it all and he deserves it all, I should do my best to give him all. And I think more Christians should focus on trying to make God and, and Jesus the Lord of their life and letting them fill their lives so much with that, that they don't have time to think about any politics or any campaigns or uh, anything they, you know, they saw a new campaign ad on the TV. They need to talk about like, we should just become to where we find those things, just a waste of time and a drain and disgusting because they're just trying to pull us away from the King. Yeah. You know, that's one of the things that I brought up in a conversation recently off air and that I've brought up quite a bit is like all these problems exist and the alleged purpose of government in solving these problems is to allocate resources. But if you must allocate resources in order to get people elected to office, then what if those resources were simply allocated to start with to the like problems that exist? What if instead of electing people so that they can redistribute taxes so that those taxes can maybe go to services if they're not going to something more corrupt. You could just feed somebody who needs it, provide them a house, give them money if they so choose, if, if, if they're in need. Like if, like, if people just did direct action, things would be a lot better off. Instead of finding like some middleman to do it on a bureaucratic level instead of re- like relying on the state and that's one of the things is that the power of the church really relies in its ability to generate community and generate like people together on the same mission with the same mind and like if every church had risen up during the pandemic and said we are not going to close our doors we are not going to stop operation and none of our patrons are going to follow your rules, um, there would have been no contest. They wouldn't have had the numbers to stop them all. But they didn't. So many of them were just like, well, we don't want to get the government uh, action against us, and hey, we're also locally embedded in local politics, and how would that look at the next meeting? How would that look at the next election? How would that look if the people that said support these politicians uh, we're going against what these politicians had to say. I mean, to those of us on this side of, you know, like, uh, anti-statism, it would look pretty based. But on the side of, like, you know, electoral politics and, you know, trying to play the game, it would not. Especially since people on both sides of the, like, alleged sides, they're just two wings on the same evil bird. Uh, especially since people on both sides of the issue are generally... um you know, corrupt, compromised. Trump was Johnson and Johnson guy. Trump was also, you know, involved with a variety of pretty anti-Christian measures and personalities and philosophies, and he was a war hawk. Um, And so many of these people involved in this are. So when you start asking these little questions like, you know, uh, d- does your church really operate for the purposes of edifying Christ, or does it operate for the purpose of reifying existing power structures? A lot of people can't say the prior. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think, to go back to what you were talking about kind of at the beginning, the watching the church cave to the state at the beginning and then extended through COVID was probably the most disappointing thing I'll see in my lifetime. Um, That was the church's moment to really stand up, to really become vocal. Um, 
and to really push back and show their numbers and use their numbers. Um, and they, they, they failed dramatically. I mean, that's why we have a couple of these pockets, you know, where we can co point to and, and to be fair, the state knows this. I mean, um, I, his name's escaping me. I follow him on Twitter, but, uh, in Canada, uh, that, that preacher that they arrested, that's still going through court dealings because he stood up to them. Um, there was one state in the United States where some Christians had gathered in a parking lot to sing together during the whole COVID thing and, and they arrested them. Um, that was our moment to go, holy cow, this is not right. We should serve God rather than man. And we have plenty of, of ways to point to that. We could talk about how the Christians of family, we could talk about how uh, Jesus wants us to assemble together. We could talk about how um, not being together as a family weakens the family. Um, there were a whole host of scriptures and examples and things we could have used. And instead, the church just laid down and, and said, when, whenever you say we can come back, uh, uh, okay. <laughs> yep. Uh, and, and that's one of the things probably that, helped me see the true and should have helped more people see the the true the the christians working harder to follow and be obedient than those who aren't um i mean it was so important to me that my wife and i our church did that and we said okay we'll list our house for sale and we went and found a church that didn't succumb to the state and then we moved uh, you know uh, i think it was 45 or 50 miles and bought a new house and uprooted our family um, because those things are important and the church should have taken that more important. Um, you know, instead, while we're watching grandma and grandpa on TV hug their kids and die alone through plastic and walls and people with cancer treatments and whatever that can't say goodbye to their loved ones and everything, we, the church, I, I say we, you know, just meaning the church general, went along with that. We said that was okay. We said that's acceptable. And when we did that, we said people and loving people and putting people ahead of ourselves and loving our neighbor as ourself, all the things that Jesus taught, not really worth it. Yeah. Um, and, and, and we lost. Yeah. And, and that's like, you know, the, the, the Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego story is, is like basically like it's it's a warning it's do yeah. um you know when the emergency hits when the the heat is on literally um you know do what needs to be done anyway a, a good example that uh, that that i you know that ron white brought up uh i think on joe rogan uh was uh like mattress mac versus joel osteen Whereas yeah. <laughs> Joel Osteen, he like had the church like locked up during the hurricane um, and people couldn't use his gigantic church uh, to like shelter in uh, despite the fact that he had it. And despite the fact that he could have, you know, shut down his sermons for a bit, he could have like, you know, given sermons to the people in the church um, who were, you know, <laughs> somewhat captive audience instead he didn't do any of that and he just kept it shut down during the hurricane when people needed it and this is a massive church this is one of those churches where like you know it's it's due to like absolute billions that have poured through that place at ver like in total over the time that it's been there um and like this church would have been a good place to shelter had joel osteen been an authentic follower of christ but this was not the case, and we found that out because uh, Joel Osteen uh, did not do that. But Mattress Mac, a guy who ran a mattress store, did. He uh, he had already made the decision before any of this had happened that he was going to uh, open uh, like a couple of his locations as shelters, and like this allowed hundreds of people to like come in there and like be housed during a time period when they otherwise wouldn't be and in not too shabby conditions in a nice well-lit place good mattresses new beds and like 
he did this because he understood that this was a need that needed to be filled. This is how every church should be during a disaster. Every church should be a shelter. Um, the place that was handing me out pamphlets to thumbs up and thumbs down policies to have, should have taken a direct action approach. They had plenty of like open spaces available when a lot of people's local homes burned down, but they didn't do that because they aren't really a church, and a lot of these places aren't. Churches should be powerhouses and community centers and places where people can really like come there in times of need. Uh, that that's that's a huge thing in the Bible is, you know, uh, g give unto those who need them, be a good Samaritan, wash the feet of those who, you know, like it's 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 a it's a book about service. But so many Christians would rather not serve and just get the benefits of service. They would like to get that donation bowl nice and filled up and like ignore the needs of filling the cups of those in their community who have been filling their coffers for years. It's it's honestly pathetic. Um but like it's the same kind of thing there as it is here. It's like, you know, we're talking about people who like instead of like like supporting people direct using the the resources they have, their limited resources, whatever they have. Um they would rather uh, like close their doors in people's times of need and instead vote for people. Instead say, we'll wait for a resolution. Instead say, we'll wait for our elected representative to hand down an edict. Well, if, if, if I remember correctly, the edicts have already been handed down. They're in a dusty book somewhere, right? Yeah, I, I mean... To me, I think, uh, and it hasn't always been the case. This has been in the last hundred years, uh, but that's part of the teaching of Scripture. I mean, that's why we have, for example, Hebrews chapter 11, which talks about all the faith of all the heroes before us. And the point of that is, is saying they didn't know the outcome, yet they had faith and they did it anyway. Um, you know, even for Abraham and the, the sacrifice of Isaac, it says that he reasoned that God was just able to bring him back to life. And faith, that type of faith, the faith that we're supposed to have, you know, Jesus says faith is a mustard seed will move mountains. So the faith that Chris supposed to have, the faith, the faith that Jesus wants Christians to have will cause us to do things that seem unreasonable. So as it relates to COVID, the reasonable thing was, oh, well, if I am near another person, I'm going to kill them. That's what the government told you. But the reasonable thing was uh, to do what they did 100 years ago uh, in the big flu outbreak. They were short on, on staff and people to help take care of those who were sick at the time. And it was a huge, massive outbreak. Most of their volunteers were Christians. And the reason being is Christians reasoned that if they got sick and died helping take others, that it was worth it. And that was just 100 years ago. So we need to be, the church should be, working on building the faith back to that. And instead, COVID just showed how far away we actually are from having the faith that we're supposed to have. We are just fearing and scared of death. Um, and it just shouldn't be that way. There, there comes not only that, but there also comes the, uh, the the fact that like so many Christians are directly involved in anti-Christian efforts, like war, for instance. <clears throat> the war machine. You're supposed to turn your 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 swords into plowshares. You're supposed to turn you know your life toward peace, and like not serve two masters. But so many Christians, uh, allegedly using their words so many christians are not well, supportive of that not sure what's item. going on oh uh, apologies yeah actually um i i forgot to unmute when i reconnected all right oh, back yeah. on track all right yeah. uh, th this is this is a like twitter space is somewhat janky i have to have my phone <laughs> connected 
and then I have to put in an ear like a, a, a wire to make the phone quiet so that I can use my mic when I invite me as a speaker. It's a whole thing. So what what I was yeah, gonna yeah. Say, what I was gonna say is um and, and that that's that's like something to keep in mind is that uh like a lot of these things they, they cross translate. Um and like for instance, when you're not supposed to serve two masters you're not supposed to serve two masters into war either. So many Christians claim to serve God, but they are not converting their swords to plowshares. They are not in this for peace. They are in this for war. Um, and in many cases, the war that they are in that they are in this for, they are in it so that they can go, you know, feel like they're in the Crusades, or they can feel like they're in, in the witch trials and they can go feel like they're taking down some degenerates or some like some inferior religions. Um, but to me, this all misses the like the, the heart of Christianity. And the ultimate truth is that like the final war had been won. That's the whole point of Christ and the sacrifice thereof. So therefore the Crusades were unethical and a good way to bastardize the spirit of the religion. Um, and the new crusades that a lot of people have uh, against various, you know, minorities, like, you know, the, the Westboro thing, um, or the, like, the, the globalist crusades for the military-industrial complex saying we're going to take down those Middle Easterners because they're Muslim, um, you know, or any number of other things that, Christians, um, you know, with a severe trademark symbol added, um, use in order to justify following the system and serving two masters. Like, a lot of Christians are totally okay endorsing the war machine, and in doing so, they serve mammon and not God. And this is a huge problem. Um, maybe your input on, like, Christians as it comes to foreign policy? Yeah, I mean, my uh, my base uh, stance on that is uh, the Old Testament taught, and I think Jesus teaches the same principle. Though I like the wording of the Old Testament, it's you shall teach the uh, you shall treat the foreigner as a brother among you. And so n now go apply that. What person are we supposed to not treat like a brother? Um, you know, even, even Romans 12, Paul expounds on Jesus teaching of loving your enemy. And it says literally to give them water and food, mm. your enemy. So let's, let's say the people at the border in Mexico actually intend to do us harm. Like the politicians say, so if the politicians say it, you can know it's not true, but let's say they actually did. Well, well what does the scripture tell Christians to do? Give them food and water. Mm -hmm. You know, why Why are we praising the government authorities when they're on video emptying, emptying gallon jugs of water? Yeah. Why would we do that? That's not, that's not what a Christian is supposed to be doing. That's not what we're instructed to do. Um, as it relates to foreign policy, I mean, I, I don't remember the exact quote off the top of my head, but I love the way David Lipscomb put it about the Civil War. And it was basically that Christians shouldn't take a side, but they should be standing eager, eagerly waiting to take care of the of the people wounded and killed and harmed once the conflict was over. And so, you know, I kind of view that as how Christians should be. We should be neutral. We shouldn't support war. But we should be there ready to help clean up. We should be there ready to help restore people, to help heal people. Um, that's the perfect time to teach people about Jesus. So um, treat them as your brother and be ready to help heal them are, are my two principles that I would tell people. Yeah, well, and, and that's the other thing is that they, they want to say, oh, well, we're all about my constitution, but my constitution doesn't apply to foreigners. Does does it? I mean, isn't this a Christian nation, as you continually say, Mr. Conservative? Isn't this a Christian na So if your constitution allows you to disobey the Bible, it's not that good a constitution, is it? 
Or maybe well, and- it should be supplemented with your true constitution, which didn't need that other one to be written down. Yeah, uh, uh, well, and then I always just have the thought exercise. I do it in reverse. You know, let's say Texas is trying to kill your children. What what are you going to do as a parent? And they always go, well, I, I'm going to I'm grab them and I'm going to run. Well, where are you going to run to? You're, you're telling me that we can't run across imaginary lines, and that's a big problem. So where are you headed? Mm-hmm. Well, you know, so if these people are willing to put their children and themselves through everything to get here because it's so bad and they so want a better life. Uh, How would I want them to treat me on the return? Would I want them to accept me? Of course, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. So um, I I think uh, it's another thing where fear is driving Christian's response. Um, You know, uh, so what if they are all bad people? Jesus literally says that you're supposed to love your enemies and do good to them. And you can't do good to somebody when you're wishing that they would be bombed and killed. It's just not possible. Yeah, and, and the other half of that is the absolute ignorance of current reality and the historical realities that pervade things. So like, the reason a lot of these people are coming from their home countries all the way over here, risking razor wire um, and and guns and beatings and chemicals and death and cages and getting separated from their families and etc., is because their homes have been destroyed by what? By the foreign policy of nations like the U.S. and nations allied with the U.S. So it's like... The U.S. fucked their places up and is now telling them they can't come here and get anything, any sort of resources. If the cops destroy somebody's house here, um, then people here would demand that the government pay for that. People here would say that the government owes people restitution for what it destroys. But for some reason... When it comes to foreigners, when it comes to people from other places um, that the U.S. government has destroyed, them coming here as a refugee from wars that the U.S. has engaged in, from regimes that they've installed, from countries they've destabilized, from mega corporations they've put in place, from all these things, um, somehow, uh, like these people aren't entitled to similar compensation and shouldn't even be able to come to a better place that is relatively better because of the circumstances by which it has made the other places worse. That's evil. Yeah, I mean, when you when you look at... I mean, there's videos on Twitter that go across all the time um, for stuff in Europe and, and refugees and immigrants and everything, and... You know, everybody always, you know, tells me, well, they should just lock down their borders. <laughs> they should just lock down their borders. And I always say, well, maybe they should quit bombing these people's families and ruining their lives. Have you thought about that? Maybe that's the actual solution. Yeah. Where do you want them to go when their place has been bombed to nothing? What do you want them to do? Yeah. Like, they, there is no other option for them but to leave and go somewhere. That's that's it. Any of us would do that in that same situation. Yeah, and you know, like, the other sorts of things um, in this regard that are worth noting is, like, when it, when it comes to, like, all of these people, the, the, the politicians that stay closest to Christ, allegedly, are often boastful. They're often arrogant. They often have their roots in hostility to empathy, um, they, they are the kinds of people who would have been draining their coffers into the, like, into the giant funnel so that they could put on a good show. But a lot of these people don't have that spirit within them. They don't have that mentality of this is for humility and service. The, one of the things that you can find is that God was directly commanding people to um, be humble, to be quiet, to be... You know, like to go into their closet to pray, to not do their worship in front of others, to make 
their like walk with Christ a uh, an act of service and humility and not to be arrogant because you would have your like you would have your 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 reward in heaven. And so generally speaking, uh I I find that a lot of Christians, uh, alleged Christians are not very much on board with that. And instead of having the mentality of I'm doing this to help other people, um they would rather have the mentality I'm, of I'm doing this to help myself, to boost my image. You know? Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of, there's a, there's a bad idea out there that if people see us acting extra righteous, that they'll want to become Christians. And that's not what scripture speaks. In fact, Jesus gives a, a real good example of the Pharisee, you know, lifting his eyes up and praying boastfully versus the, the man, you know, looking down and, and begging for forgiveness. Jesus says there he, he had his reward. The, the Pharisee had his reward. So we think Christianity is something about, you know, making it big and beautiful and bold. And so everybody can see. And, and I think that's just a misnomer of the, the, the principle Jesus teaches about how the, the Christians are to be a light in a city on a hill. And I think we think that that's kind of what the church is supposed to be and, and what we should be, but but that's really not. The idea there is that you are the bright spot in a bad world. And so when nobody, for example, will love the immigrant, the Christian will love the immigrant. When nobody will go see the prisoners and take care of them, the Christian will take care of the prisoners. When nobody cares about the hungry, the Christians take care of the hungry. It's not these big, huge monumental things like we think it's the small tasks that love people that nobody else wants to do and so we get caught up in that i mean we get uh, you know uh, you mentioned go into your closet to pray absolutely um another one that that's not heated and practiced enough is when you give don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing how private and quiet should your giving be um but Christians want to boast about how much they gave and how much they saved and what they sent overseas and what they did all of this. And, oh, look at us, look at us, look at us. And, and, but it's not supposed to be about that. It's supposed to be quiet and peaceful and gentle. And being that person that just – and being that group of people that's just always seeking to love others, and that should be the bright spot. Um, and we've gotten distracted with what the light and the, and the shining of the light really should be. Yeah, and and because it's and and that's the other thing is that it's not your light. It's not the light of the the person in question. It's the light of God, or it's not light at all. Um, that's the whole point of the Bible. So yep. the idea that we should you know like lift these people up um, when they're lifting people up and not the spirit is antithetical to the Bible. Yeah, and like so. In that spirit, uh, you were talking in the beginning a bit about charities you support. And um, in general, like, let's talk direct action for a second. What are some things that you think people can do in terms of direct action, in terms of, like, actually putting their money and their mouth, like, their, their actions where their mouth is? Yeah, I, really, I would say there it's to seek organizations that explicitly do specific things to love and help others. Um, uh, you know, example, there's a, uh, I, I can't run to the border and give water, for example, but there's groups out there that you can donate to that they have people that go and provide water along the border. Um, just, that's just one example, but there's all these kinds of things. And I think what we should do as Christians is look at the things Jesus says about, you know, uh, you visited the person in prison and, and, and visited the person and you took care of the person that was hungry and you could, took care, care of the person that was thirsty. And, and then they say, well, well, when did we do these things? When did we see you like this? And Jesus says, when you did it to the least, you did it to me. And so I think we should focus on finding, uh, obviously finding direct means, you know, with our hands is probably the best way. But if you work with your hands to earn money and then in turn you give money and these organizations are specifically helping in specific ways, 
I think those are the two best ways that we can affect change and that we can um, do the things that Jesus wants us to do. For sure. So w- do you do anything in your local community? Uh, I mean, there are things that that I do and there are things that my family does. Um, some of them are uh, better than others. Some of them are small tokens. Uh, one thing I think that's important there is when Jesus says, even if it's, just, if it's just a cup of cold water to the person in need, I think we sometimes get enamored with our own selves in what we do give. And we think, oh, well, if I, you know, if I gave more then you know, kind of like you were talking about the, the rich man and the widow with the two mites earlier, we think if we gave, if we just, you know, monetarily gave more that, that, that means we're better, but being better is uh, for a Christian is just noticing people hurting and doing what you can to ease their hurting. And so sometimes that's small, sometimes that's big. Sometimes that's with people, you know, sometimes that's with people you don't know. Sometimes it's in your community or out of your community. Um, so I would just say that I, I'm not really going to talk about anything specific, um, but I just want to note that it doesn't have to be, people listening to this. It doesn't have to be huge. It just has to be caring and loving and focused and consistent. And that's what Jesus asked of us. For real. All right. So. Uh, something else, you know, uh, like, we'll, we'll, you know, get to, like, anything that, like, you feel really needs to be hammered down. But something something that's interesting is uh, there are a lot of, um, like, anarchists out there who don't appreciate the Christian anarchist message because of the following of the God. And they believe that the like it's 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 somewhat coercive, and that the like potential threat of hell during in, like in certain interpretations of the Bible or the uh, the 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 threat of eternal darkness or whatever threat whatever or the fact that it's like following uh, somebody identified as a king um, is disqualifying, and. To me, my answer to this, and you know, you can you can give your sort of answer to them specifically. My answer to this is, if God is real, then this is the best possible way for people to move forward. Um, so if they're right, this is the way to move forward, and this is going to like minimize harm and maximize benefit. Like so, at the very least, you know, there's there's something there. Like, uh, and if Christians are wrong, then there is no God. You're going to, like, blink out of existence anyway. And these people helped you as other anarchists. Because I'm all about anarchist unity. I'm the whole bottom strip. Um, Sure. Like, the Christians will have helped you because of their own personal reasons, which they are entitled to have. They will have helped you get rid of earthly rulers. And why is that a problem just because you might disagree with their particular methods? That's my answer to these people. I would wonder what's, what, what your answer would be. Like, either way, whether there is a God or isn't, whether they're right or wrong, um, like, the Christian anarchist modus is going to make it better for people here on Earth. And if they are right, then it doesn't matter what these people think about Christianity uh, these people are living the best life they can within that structure. So, to me, it's it's like, it's an easy answer. These people are, like, allies. They're allies to the cause because they choose to be. And they're making better choices than the statists, surely. Yeah, I would, you know, uh, in anarchist philosophy, really everything is based around consent. Um you know, even in anarchism, uh, you can have a group of people consent to live under a, a certain ruler if they wanted. Um, the whole idea is that they could leave if they wanted, which is the problem with the state. Um, and, and that same principles with Jesus. He doesn't force you to love him. He asks you to come to him and you can choose to love him or you can choose to quit loving him. Um 
I, I don't really find the whole mentioning of hell. I've heard that uh, before as a very valid excuse because motivators uh, are used at different points in a person's life. Use different motivators with children, use different motivators with animals. Um, and so while maybe the fear of hell starts as an original motivator for somebody in coming into a relationship with Jesus, that actually isn't supposed to be there um, in time. It's supposed to go away. First John uh, 4.18, it says, if we are afraid, it is for fear of punishment. And this shows that we have not fully experienced his perfect love. So once you grow into a relationship with Jesus and are experiencing his perfect love, hell's not even part of the equation anymore. It's literally about the relationship. Uh, it's it kind of be like um, obeying your parent because they might throw you out of the house versus obeying your parent because you love your parent. Um, and so I think on that front, it's important for those people to realize that um, while some might still be uh, infants in the faith and motivated by fear that we're not, the average Christian is not functioning in this manner because they have any fear of hell. I don't have any fear of hell because I'm, I'm in this relationship. I'm in it for love. I'm not in it for, for fear. Um, so that'd be the first, the first part I would answer to that. Oh, gotcha. So, all right. And, 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 you know, the other half of that to me is like, they start to talk about all these structures that have been built up around the church and say that a lot of them are oppressive. Sure. A lot of them are oppressive, but a lot of those structures are directly disobedient to parts of the Bible. So if those people in these structures, the state, it's affiliated banks, it's mega corporations, it's industrial complexes, it's state-affiliated churches. If all these people are ignoring the Bible, then the Bible is not the problem. It's the ignorance thereof and the manipulation of the people and the Spirit of God to try and turn people against the actual teachings that Christ had uh, in his words. So the whole idea to me is that like, if people are willing to actually stick by it, then they're respectable. You know, you talk about obeying parents, but that's another, you know, rulership structure, and it has the same strictures. Like, for instance, like, if the parent is a master, and the parent is teaching you to do things that aren't of God, um, or that aren't godly, uh, if the parent is not behaving in a way that is worthy of respect, for instance, being violent with their child, um, sexually abusing their child, trying to indoctrinate their child into the state, trying to keep their child uh, nice and prepped for the, the mega corporate world, trying to tell their child uh, like all manner of you know, you know, filth in the name of God, uh, encouraging violence, encouraging uh, you know, participation in the system and its structures and all of this. According to this like Christian anarchist mentality, you're supposed to disobey that parent. Like, Jesus will come as a sword to divide, you know, in, insert thing against insert thing. Family was a heavy thing in that series of verses. I'm just not going to recite it all right now because it's, you know. Um, like, so if you follow God primarily and that leads you away from your parent, it's because your parent was not worthy of the honor and they did not give the honor to God. And so it's one of those things where... If a parent is worthy of that honor, generally their kids are going to do what they want. If they're if, if the parent isn't uh, like acting in anger, isn't letting the sun go down on their anger, isn't lashing out, isn't living by the proverbial sword, or in many cases the belt, the spoon, the hand, the fist. If that parent is worth the like the the, the following, it will be because that parent like in a Christian sense. It will be because that parent has followed a Christian sensibility. And so many parents that demand the honor your mother and your father part are not honoring the rest of the word. And that's the key problem in those regards, I think, is because, like, you know, following, like, the Bible itself is a liberating thing for many people in many cases. And I think if more people, like, actually took the full context and were like, this all cross applies. The context matters. 
they would be a lot less skittish about doing like about following a life of Christian anarchy because it would make more sense to them. Yeah, I want to go back to one of the first things you were talking about with uh, what we would call organized religion. And I think the the real problem with some of that is um, the general person, whether they're an active Christian or not, they tend to trust what they see from religion. So whether that's Roman Catholics or the Mormon Church or um, pick any of your major denominations and they've fallen for a, a believing and understanding that the way they act is what the Bible condones. Um, but those people never, I say never being generally, there are some that do, but they never generally have they really, they, they never really have picked up the Bible themselves to understand the religion that Jesus has actually called us to. I mean, uh, scripture says pure and undefiled religion is to visit widows and orphans in their time of need and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. That's what that's what Christians are actually supposed to be trying to do. Yeah, that's that's what true religion is. But we've become succumbed to the whole charade of the catholic church or the whole big huge temple deal that the mormons operate or, or all that stuff and societies come to think oh well that's what christianity is but but that's not what christianity is i mean in the new testament alone as the church is operating 26 times it says in scripture that they met from house to house um the church is intended to be families that are operating together for the good of one another. Um, and they're supposed to be out there serving others. Um, nowhere does scripture suggest massive temples and hierarchies and, and all this type of stuff. Um, it never suggests property ownership, but never suggests everything that we see that people hate about organized religion today, mm -hmm. but they haven't picked up their Bible to see that for themselves and understand that they think what they see is what religion, you know, is called to be. And it's simply not that Jesus never calls us to that. Yeah. I mean, the Vatican is the largest landowner in New York city. That's evil. And you know, when there's a disaster, like a lot of those churches aren't opening up their doors. They're not giving of the Vatican's massive wealth. A lot of the time, they, they would rather hire law lawyers to cover up child sex abuse than they would help hurricane victims or people who need shelter from the smoke from local fires uh, or any number of other things than, you know, like in New York City or any of the other places, really. Because, like, the Vatican owns the churches that, like, that are operant in the U.S. if it's a part of the official Catholic, like, Catholic church. So, like... The whole deal there is these people own and control this property, but what are they doing with it? Well, certainly not serving God. A lot of the time, they're doing it to serve their own purposes. They're doing it to install politicians. They're doing it to assist banks. They're doing it to flow power. It's, it's, it's not about the power of God. It's about enabling their own. Yeah, and, and you know, it's difficult because... Uh, you know, we're human beings. We have five senses. We have the sense of fear, which is not, I know one of the five senses, but we, we, we become fearful. Um, and it's easy to succumb to all of that uh, and, and start trusting only what you can see and what's around you. Um, one of the things in the new Testament that I'm always, that kind of makes me smile is when scripture says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but we wrestle against principalities and powers and rulers of darkness and heavenly places. Absolutely. Um, that, that's, why, that's why I said earlier, the Christian and churches have gotten so sidetracked by politics and voting for somebody and who a president's going to be and all this stuff. But, but we don't even wrestle against that person is what scripture says. Uh, and how are we going to defeat rulers and powers in heavenly places? Well, we defeat that, Scripture says, by expanding the church. 
We defeat that by telling people about Jesus. We defeat that by others coming to know the love of Christ, and we keep expanding his kingdom. Um, and the, the beautiful picture of that described in Scripture is in Daniel uh, in the Old Testament, where it says that his kingdom grows into a mountain that covers the whole earth and destroys all other authority. The, the literal only way as a Christian for me, uh, and this is not speaking for anybody that listens to this specifically, but as a Christian, the only way to defeat whatever authority or ruler that I view as bad, and we can say Biden if you're on one side and Trump if you're on another and Hillary and Xi and Kim Jong and Putin and, and name your favorite ruler that you hate. Javier Malay. The, the only way to defeat them is to expand and help expand the kingdom of Jesus because he is the only one with power to defeat them. You mean you mean if we just like, you know, vote those Republicans or vote those Democrats or vote the left or vote the right out, we're not gonna do anything? Darn it. I was on I was I was on my Sal the Agorist grind set. <laughs> well, and see, and here's why here's why talking this way matters. Scripture and how Christians are supposed to, to act and operate and what Scripture says applies whether I'm here sitting in the United States or I'm a Christian in North Korea or I'm a Christian in China or I'm a Christian in Russia. All those same things apply. And Jesus expects the same of all of his people in each of those places. So, you know, if, if we're going to argue that... Uh, Trump was, you know, some special messenger of God. We need to start arguing that that she in China is a, a a huge messenger of God. You know, we need to start arguing, oh, that Putin is a messenger of God, and then we 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 start getting back to the people people don't like to talk about. Then we start needing to say that Hitler was was a messenger of God, and and we just get all off track because especially here in the West, in the United States, we have come to think that we are some special ambassadors for liberty and freedom in the world but but we're not we're not any different than any other country and so that's where christians have an opportunity to speak about jesus to speak about what jesus commands us to do and that is universally applicable for us all over the world yeah absolutely and and that's the thing is that a lot of these people are Christian nationalists. Like, they're not actual Christians. They're nationalists who pretend to be Christian. Like, that's what Andrew Torba at Gab is. And he wrote this whole book where he uh, pretended that uh, the, 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 the real, like, message of Christ was to use government to make disciples of nations. And no, it wasn't. It never was. But he uses a bunch of false justifications. I've got some people writing some stuff for Anarch Unity, a site I launched not too long ago, uh, d dedicated to anarchist unity. Um, and Gap Air has a has an account there. He's posted a couple things, also Kareem Mays and a few other people. Um, but basically, the the general vibe at that place is going to be like anarchist unity and moving against the state. But like um, th the general thing is that a lot of people. A lot of people have gotten involved in this sort of thing, you know? They've gotten their, their, their head wrapped up in politics as the way to solve their problems. And instead of, like, trusting God, instead of trusting his plan, they would rather trust, um, you know, some politician. They would rather pretend that this politician is going to act as their emissary. Never. It's never, because, like, people are corruptible. People, like people are susceptible to all the same evils that they always were. Yeah, that's one of the, uh, that brings to mind one of the parables Jesus tells where he talks about someone that was filled with demons and the demons were, you know, released and left. And uh, that person didn't fill themselves with good things. And so the demons came back and found the place was swept and clean. And so they moved back in basically is how it's framed. And so, one thing I think uh, on that front of the, the anarchy type deal is, is and, and I know anarchy includes people that are atheists, but the principles of Jesus apply, period, whether you're a believer or not. And I think what we need to be doing in, in 
in a way is when we're talking about these principles of anarchy and being against the state and everything in similar manner to the demons that were out that were that were uh, kicked out but came back we need to make sure that we're talking about things that, that we're going to replace it with because we don't want those demons to move back in there's no point kicking out a state to have a state immediately i mean that's what the founders did hey let's get rid of britain and bring in a new state and you know patrick henry and and, and several others of the time said this is worse <laughs> what are y'all doing and yeah, so thomas Paine. that's what's that thomas Paine as well yeah and thomas Paine as well and so i think that's where you know again uh, i understand there are atheists and non-believers in the movement and and that's that's great but we need to be talking about replacing the state with principles of jesus because they're good principles um even elon musk has quoted jesus several times in interviews and said look this is whether or not you believe he's God, this is an actual right way to live. And so we need to be talking more about, hey, when we kick the state out, how are we gonna focus on loving other people? How are we going to focus on doing this? How are we gonna focus on doing that? How are we gonna focus on um, having better jobs for people? How are we gonna focus on increasing technology? How are we gonna focus on better healthcare? How are we gonna focus on cleaner water? And instead of just saying, oh, well, we're just going to kick the state out, we need to make sure that we're filling ourselves with good, wholesome things and, and things that we're going to practice and things we're going to do so that the state has no place to move back into. You know, if you kick the state out and then suddenly we don't have a plan and we're not working together towards clean water, you're going to have, you know, think about back in Moses when the, when the people left Egypt, what they just want to do, go back to Egypt. So... All you're going to do in that instance is have people clamoring to get the state back. So we need to be working together and speaking about plans for solving real life, real world issues in a manner without the state. Yeah, absolutely. Like, and, and the thing is that, like, you know, that that's one of the things is like, oh, libertarians should go down to Texas and help them defend their right to self defense. No, in fact. Throwing families into water filled with razor wire is not self-defense. And uh, when, like, Greg Abbott creates giant, like, buoys of razor wire that he stretches between, uh, like, giant sections of water so that he can, like, bury the razor wire in the water and make it a hazardous experience to even try to come to this place, that is not the spirit of Christ. It never was. Um, and when these people say that, you know, oh, if Texas secedes, that'll be great. And if we have this new civil war, that'll be great for liberty. No, it won't. Uh, the only thing that'll be good for is enriching the, po the pockets of the warmongers, the people who, like the Malthusians who say, you are the carbon we want to reduce. Um, because <laughs> the, the, the people in charge would love us to start killing each other over the ability to kill foreigners so that they could get their killing in, so that they could have their, like, century-defining like century defining war, just like they did with World Wars One and Two. Uh, they, they would love to have that, because what that would mean for them is that they could get their way. They could get their money. They could get more and more militarism, and it's even closer to the borders, so they could say, oh, well, you know what? When, when, when people said that we shouldn't be doing foreign adventurism over in Asia, like, they were right. The Middle East and Africa, we definitely shouldn't be here. We should invade Mexico, like Vivek Ramaswamy wanted uh, to do. Um, you know, we should militarize the border and all this stuff. When they say this stuff, what they're saying is, I don't mind being a part of that which wipes out humanity. What they're saying is, I don't mind being a part of that which enriches mammon and enriches the state and enriches the masters who act outside of the interest of God. And doing all of this, acting massively inhospitable to people just because of where they come from. That is anti-Christian. But these people have no problem being anti-Christ uh, in his name because they are not with the heart of it and because they would rather support some foreigner, you know, for instance, beating the shit out of people uh, because he's allegedly an anarcho-capitalist in charge of Argentina now, 
uh, Javier Malay beating the shit out of people using cops because those people are allegedly commies for the dastardly crimes of not wanting a facial recognition super state, a prison industrial complex, and the value of the peso to be halved while foreign currency replaces it, meaning that, like, their savings are gutted. They have nothing, and the economy already sucked. That's why he got in. So, like, these people are desperate, and the the last bit of stuff they had has been stripped from them by 50%. That would piss off every American. Not just, like, you know, commies, not just leftists, not just... It, it would piss off every American if Biden halved the dollar of the value and allowed the, the value of the currency to be like exploited by foreign dollars uh, by like installing dollarization to push us onto a foreign central bank are you kidding nobody here would support that but you know a bunch of fake libertarians a bunch of um fake christians are supporting this and supporting malay because i don't like commies they've been partisanized and propagandized and they've been taught to dehumanize and they've been taught to not see their fellow person as a person and none of this is none of these words are in the Bible. Well, and that's why that's why I brought up that we have to be talking about replacements. Absolutely. I mean, otherwise, you, uh, you. I mean, we all saw what Sal Mayweather said this week, or was it last week on Twitter with the Argentinian cops? Mm -hmm. What is he doing? Yeah. He's arguing for replacing the state with the state. Yes, and with a worse that, one. That, that does nothing. So if we're not talking about actual solutions, um, then all we're going to do is, is, you know, kick one tyrant out and just pick up another. And, and that's not even worth the effort at that point. Yeah, like, like uh, uh, somehow a seceded government of Texas uh, with like the, 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 was its own country led by Greg Abbott would be a fucking paradise. I think not. No, I mean, <laughs> uh, in COVID, they were ar arresting uh, barbers and beauticians trying to cut hair. So yeah, yeah, I, I don't, I don't think it's going to be as great as they think. <laughs> How quickly they forget. Uh, that reminds me. The best part about that was, um, I know this is a little sidetrack, but uh, it that just it just cracks me up every time. So Greg Abbott issued the executive order at the time that people would be arrested, and then. In Dallas, they started arresting people, and Greg Abbott changed his executive order and came out on, you know, national TV or Twitter or whatever he did at the time. I can't recall. It was like, oh man, I can't believe how how Dallas would do this. It's so <laughs> terrible and awful. You, they were just following what you issued. <laughs> what, what are you talking about? You can't believe he he completely set them up so he could have a political stunt, and it was just like. People think, you know, and, and, and when he said, oh, well, well, we would never, you know, shut stuff down and order masks. And then they were shutting stuff down and ordering masks. And, uh, you know, that's when you realize that they're just all the same. Funny and so that's why that that's why. What's that? Funny how that works. Yeah. Well, and that's why I, I, I think and I keep reiterating it right now because we're on a good topic here is I think we really have to be talking about what it's replaced with we really be, have to be talking about solutions and honestly i think that's how you win people over to the idea and the movement now granted we all get the stupid questions of who, well, who will build the roads and all that baloney um I, i'm not worried about who will build the roads you know i want to be talking about solutions for actual important things um you know let's start with the things uh jesus talks about with uh, mercy and justice let's talk about how crappy the justice system is. Let's talk about um, how we imprison more people than anywhere else on the face of the planet. Let's talk about how we uh, imprison people for a plant that God made. Let's talk about let's let's talk about actual stuff. Let's not worry about roads for a second. Let's talk about replacements for actual problems in people's lives. Yeah, and you know, speaking of roads and Greg Abbott, um, like he was all up on the side of. Da uh, Daniel Perry, I think was his name, who shot Garrett Foster uh, after driving his car into a crowd of protesters. Suddenly his car was sur surrounded by protesters. And then he's like, 
Oh, my car is surrounded by protesters. I'll use that as a pretext to shoot one of them because he's doing his Second Amendment ability to, like, uh, open carry while, like, getting between my car, my gun, and his crippled girlfriend uh, in a wheelchair. Uh, I'm going to use that with his rifle at low ready as pretext to murder him after I already didn't like him and already was racist and saying in text messages that I want to shoot BLM protesters. Um, you know, th the people who wouldn't be marching in the street if it weren't for state injustice. And what did Greg Abbott do? He said, this man should be pardoned. No, he shouldn't. <laughs> You know, one of my other favorite examples of something along those lines is, and and I, back in the day when I was a libertarian and not an anarchist, I kind of supported Rand Paul. And and one of my favorite things is when he was, you know, chanting that uh, government shouldn't fear the people. I, I mean, people shouldn't fear the government. Government should uh, fear the people, and the you know, the government should fear being bullied by the people. And then he ends up getting bullied by the people, and suddenly <laughs> there's an outcry that we need to make it so people can't bully the government. <laughs> I don't know if you remember that one. I uh, did. Yeah, it was pretty funny. Um, you know, it's like, look, you're a part of the government. Like, quit crying about being bullied. That's what you said. You know. Um, now, I, obviously, I'm a pacifist and I'm against that, but it's the the hypocritical nature of the way government and politicians work that's so infuriating absolutely it's matt seven they just need to read matt seven you know they need to take that plank out of their eye before examining the moat and their brothers oh yeah absolutely absolutely yeah so okay so what would your primary message be then to the statist because like a huge amount of my recent stuff has been telling people that, yeah, in fact, if you don't start at the philosophical level, your secession, your government policy, your whatever is not going to help. If you don't start at the philosophical level and build the philosophy up, it's not going to change anything. It's not going to make anything better. Uh, so in that spirit, um, like, I think we strongly agree on the fact that we need to build up that philosophical base before we do anything in terms of like changing society because otherwise society is going to be the same exact society it's always been so what would you say as like you know uh your sort of philosophical route what would you say to people to get them started on maybe reversing the course and getting us toward an anarchist world um on pace with christian values um, you know, it, I think the only solution real there is to just talk about it all the time. Um, that's kind of how I, I started this uh, conversation with you was just got to be vocal. Um, but we have to be vocal more often than we are. We have to be vocal explicitly. We're not being vocal explicitly enough. Um, and then we need to, again, uh, kind of what we have kind of been talking about is provide an alternate that meets that need. So, you know, for example, when I talk to people about um, the immigration problem, you know, uh, uh, open borders, there's no imaginary lines. People should be able to come and go, find jobs, work, raise their families. Uh, if they view this as a safer area, then, then great for them. But on the flip side, their coming here shouldn't increase the burden of people being stolen from via taxation. Um, it should increase the, the burden on uh, all the welfare that's handed out, the stupid public school system that exists that should be abolished. So we also need to kind of say, hey, look, here's where we're trying to love these people. Here's where we're trying to let them have a way to better their life. But here's also where I'm against harming the people already here. I'm against harming them and taking more of their money. I'm against burdening them. Um, and so we just need to be having, I think, fuller conversations that are prepared to uh, address some of the pushback and some of the quick, off-the-cuff, poor reasoning that we get. Um, 
you know, I, I think if we're going to talk uh, immigration and, and, and open borders and, and people being able to escape poor lifestyles, we just need to be talking about ending welfare simultaneously. We need to be, you know, there's just things that need, they kind of pair together. And we're really good sometimes about talking about one side, but we don't talk enough about the other pieces that go along with making it a reality. Yeah, well, and, and that's like one of the things is that like, um, if if we want to talk about ending welfare, it's the same as ending the state or seceding or whatever. Um, it's the same as that in that we need to have like a better alternate structure because these people mostly were damaged by the system and like they need a, a hand up proverbially speaking so like ultimately i would say that there's a huge thing to be said for building um, a parallel society of anarchists funding the, the the solutions funding the the like the upswing funding and being the practical actors for the new and better society like because, like, ultimately, a huge amount of these people aren't putting their money where their mouth is. Or they think that what that amounts to is donating to a political campaign. And that doesn't help people in the present. It might not even help them in the end run. Because the people who, like, get into office might find that they're not as, like, powerful. They might find that they're more impotent in these spaces. They might find that the system is insulated from their change. They might find that the corrupt system is too corrupt to allow them their way. Um, and, you know, that's generally what happens. People get in and they realize exactly, you know, how little power these people have and how much the government is literally controlled by people um, way higher up than they are and sometimes extra governmental in the form of, like, you know, corporations and banks and superstructures and international organizations and the Bilderberg Group and etc. And so, like... When these people get to that point and they're like in office, a lot of these people are like, wow, I can't do anything. Um, and ultimately, this results in a lot of problems. This results in like people uh, thinking that the, the politics are a way to change these things. And then in the end run of it, how much actually changes? Oh, nothing. Right. Because politics was never the solution. Um, and so to me... We need to find ways to address these things now that, like, are direct action. You see somebody who needs it, you give them the help they need. You build structures that can actually give people the anarchist future you want, or don't complain that you don't have it. Um, and a lot of these people aren't willing to do that. Either Christians who are, you know, tight-fisted with what they have, or um, statists who are, you know tight like fisted with what they can do and instead of like doing like what they claim people need to do and bootstrapping and pulling the society up manually a lot of them are just waiting for somebody else to do it and that doesn't help anybody in the end run all this it teaches is indolence and fucking like passing the buck kicking the can down the line and so when you end up with these people you end up with a whole lot of people who you know ignore that reality ignore that we need to you know, um, that we need to improve our conditions manually because that's the truth. The truth is, ain't nobody going to do this for us. We got to do it ourselves. Like, if we, wanna, if we want rid of the welfare state, we have to be the welfare anti-state. Yeah, I think that's, uh, so on the, on the side for Christians, I think that's where, Jesus uh, statement of if people take if someone takes your tunic, give them your, your cloak also, um, you know, the arguments always, well, you know, I already give twenty thousand dollars a year in taxes. And so I already give a lot to help all this stuff. I, I just I'm not going to give any more. Well, first off, that's not what Jesus said to do. Jesus said, if you're stolen from, give more. So. On the Christian side of things, we need to be giving more, but that goes back to what I was saying earlier is we have to go find these. It, it takes research and effort on the part of people, but we have to go find these groups that are helping affect the things we want. You know, the group I mentioned that you can give to that leaves water on the border for people. Phenomenal group. Go find it. Give to them. There's groups out there that help people file for uh, immigration to the United States and have, have lawyers on retainer for that. Go find that and give to those. Uh, there are groups out there that help 
uh, people that are sitting in prison and they're innocent and they need legal fees. Innocence Find project. those. And what's that? Innocence project. Innocence Project is one of them. Find those groups and give to them. It, when you're finding injustice among the government, there is right now, this is 2024, there's generally a group working against that. Go fund that. Um, it's going to be run better. It's going to have less waste than any government group. Um, and it's going to be focused on a specific need. And we need to really be focusing on trying to give to those specific needs. Um, you know, even something as simple as making sure um, if you have like uh, for a long time, I did it for um, uh, the Mises uh, uh, institution, your Amazon account that you can set up to where you make purchases, portions and uh, percentages go to different organizations. Make sure that's set up on your accounts wherever they have that. You know, uh, anything that you can do to redirect funds to groups that are fighting um poor actions of the state. Yes. It, are we funding the state? Yes. Are we also having to fund the solution to the state? Yes. Does that suck? Absolutely. Yes. But it's what we got to do. It's what Christians are called to do. So we just going to have to suck it up and we're going to have to be, be loud about it. We're going to be vocal. We need to be telling others about these means um, and ways to do it. Um, and we need to be active about that. Yeah, and not being bitter either, because, like, there are a whole lot of people out there who have, like, they, they pull the fascist garbage. They do the fascist garbage, where your enemy is simultaneously weak and strong. These these immigrants, for instance, are, are an invading army, and they're replacing whites, and they're evil and satanic and blah, blah. And they're commies here to commie up our commie. Uh, and then, like, when when, when it comes down to it, these people, like, they're, they're lazy at the same time. They're lazy and shiftless and welfare whores, and they're sponging off the system. Uh, if that's the case, how are they taking your jobs? If that's the case, how are they replacing you? If that's the case, how are they so powerful that they need a massive government bureaucracy to stop them? If that's the case, how, why do they need razor wire? If that's the case, why do they need a separate ID system? If that's the case, if they're just lazy... Why would the government have them here? Oh, to replace us with Democrat voters. Uh, so they vote. Uh, if in order to vote, you have to have an ID. In order to vote, you have to have, like, citizenship. Most of the places voting occurs. And, like, you know, <laughs> the places it doesn't, that's just to get access to it. It's not actually to participate. And the only people who can participate are still trying to get their documentation processed. There's a lot of fear-mongering. There's a lot of pretending. There's a lot of dehumanizing. There's a lot of label-throwing. There's a lot of lack of humility, lack of compassion, lack of humanity. And in the result of this, you have a fundamentally anti-Christian way of looking at these people and society, and as a result, da da da, -da the government it gives you is evil and follows the demonic nature of things and... Somehow we don't have a, a free country. I wonder why. Yeah, it's because we we kicked out that which is bad and, and we didn't replace it with anything good. So that which is bad came right back in. Yeah, and, and also like institutionally supported the bad. Like the founders weren't anti-status. Thomas Paine put it really well when he said things like, you know, uh, how can you be truly for freedom if you own slaves? He was an abolitionist. He was also yeah. basically anarchist, and he supported French revolutionary efforts. But you know what the uh, you know what the U.S. government did? They crushed re rebellions. They crushed efforts to rebel. Um, and why? Because the U.S. government was beholden to French gold. So no, in fact, you will not be able to trade in whiskey in order to dodge taxes. And since you're trying, here's George Washington with his fake slave teeth. Um, riding in with 13,000 other alleged tax rebels to crush a tax rebellion. The Whiskey Rebellion is proof that the government was neither independent nor free, but these people kept the illusion up because they picked a new religion. Their religion was never Christianity. This wasn't a Christian nation. It was a, a, a nation based on slavery and murder and breaking of treaties and violation of rights and trampling on people and dependence and entanglements with foreign nations it's not a christian nation 
Yeah, it's amazing how the state is always that which is opposite of Jesus. Yeah, funny how that works, and funny how it took an entire government and uh, other neighboring governments to say this man is not worth uh, life and should be killed. And funny how a lot of people want to pretend that just a little bit more government and we'll have a Christian society. There's only one way to get a Christian society, and that's when Jesus destroys all authorities. Mm-hmm. And also, I see Ancap Air there. If you wanna, if you wanna chime in, feel free. Um, but uh, either way, yeah, I, I, I feel like, I feel like there's room for massive growth if people are willing to finally admit um, that the state is the problem that trying to centralize power is the problem, that if your power center is God, that you can't have a power center that is not God, and that that means that it should be about removing any power, like, any power at all that tries to compete. So that, like, the only power that's available to follow is that, if anything at all, and only voluntarily thereof. So... The entire, like, Christian anarchy could be a way for a lot of people who are Christians to, A, become full-fledged Christians who only follow one master and not mammon, um, and then, B, uh, a way for uh, those people to act in unity with people that they're taught by the state and state-adjacent people to demonize and use as an excuse for the power of the state, um, because the only way out is up, and we need all hands on deck. We are we are lost if we can't. And there will be, you know, I always say, like, you know, um, I, I have this thing that I repeat, that we will see rivers of blood and years of darkness and a fiery apocalypse, the likes of which will make Revelation seem like a children's story. Like, because a lot of that, like, a lot of that was, like, surface-level stuff. I think it's going to be worse than Revelation. I think we're going to end up so much worse because we're ceding so much power. And right now, the state is currently ramping up the mark of the beast with the facial recognition super state and the CBDC. That's the reason you can tell false prophets because Javier Malay is over here talking to his dead dogs and um, like asking for uh, asking them for, for, for political advice. And he's doing that while installing a facial recognition super state and pushing dollarization right before the CBDC, which relies on the AI facial recognition super state, um, you know, is going to take root in America. He's not ending the Fed. He's expanding the Fed. He's making the Argentinian Fed the U.S. Fed. He's making that Fed the biggest Fed on the planet uh, in addition to ours. And he's enabling this Fed with seniorage from all the money that gets like resulted from that and so like when people are willing to ignore that when people are willing to support javier malay or any of a number of these other world leaders who got their way by like pushing statist garbage and by supporting the system and enabling it like ron paul said end the fed not get a bunch of other countries uh dependent on it that's that's like if we actually supported, like, anarchy or libertarianism, this would never be, like, remotely on our minds. But, you know, people like to see uh, the state be violent to leftists, so I guess that's enough for a lot of people who claim to be libertarians, and some of them are uh, allegedly Christians as well. I wonder why a lot of these Christians have a bad rap, if this is the public face. It, it, was, it was crazy to see... In the last couple of weeks, people cave into the whole "my enemy of my enemy is my friend." Um, like, we, no, they're both your enemies. Like, um, it's just crazy. It's possible to have more than one enemy. We're surrounded by mm -hmm. demons, mm -hmm. man. Yeah. Well, anyway, I, I think this has been a relatively productive uh, conversation, except the technical difficulties there in the middle. Uh, so with that being said, uh, what, 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 what are your last words, I guess? And we'll, we'll definitely do this again. Cause like there are some people who also want to be involved, but couldn't make it today. So. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. No, I'm, I'm starting to where I'm trying to find some time to do more of this type of stuff. Um, cause again, if I'm going to advocate that, 
we're supposed to be talking more often and, and louder that, well, that means I have to be doing that too. Right. So um, it's, it's really good. And I think it gives, especially from the, for me, from the Christian aspect, the ability to be talking more about the principles of Jesus to people and um, which is what my whole mission is. So, yeah. Well, uh, where can people find you? Do you, do you uh, have any light content you make? Cause this is our first conversation I think ever. So I, I don't really, um, just what I post on Twitter. Um, I don't really have a, a page or anything that I explicitly write articles or anything for at the moment. Cool. Well, you, uh, you are only King Christ on Twitter or only Christ King. I actually only King Christ. Yeah. Okay. All right. Cool. Yeah. I, I, I needed to scroll down before checking and I did not do that. Uh, okay. So, uh, with that in mind, this will be available on Facebook, YouTube, Odyssey and BitChute by the end of the day. Um, and there will also be another stream on my personal channel, uh, just a weekly audience engagement stream so people are free to show up in the chat. But this will be a, a thing that happens every Wednesday and every Saturday. So y'all feel free to tune in. Um, there will be a new subject typically uh, every week, uh, well, every episode. Um, and I want to start really hammering down on certain topics that need attention, especially since, like, we need a massive anti-fascist, anti-statist counter signal to some of the stuff that's been coming out. So Sounds like you just need an Argentinian police force. Yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, all, all I need is just one more cop. Then we'll be good. Then we'll be good. <laughs> well, I, I appreciate the invite. Thanks for chatting with me. It was great. Um, yeah, uh, I'm always down, especially for topics that need uh, a Christian perspective. Uh, I love talking about those. Awesome. And uh, yeah, pleasure meeting you. Thank you for coming on, because like as many different perspectives as possible, that's what I'm here for. All hands on deck. We need like otherwise this is hitting the iceberg and we are drowning. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Well, with that being said, I think that's a good place to wrap it up. 